The subjects of my sermon this morning are faith and doubt, certainty and uncertainty, belief and unbelief. Now, perhaps a few of you are thinking, why on earth talk about belief and unbelief? What is the point of doing that in a sermon to a congregation of Seventh-day Adventists in church on Sabbath morning? Surely, if anywhere, the presence of faith and belief can be taken for granted, that faith and belief is here and it's not problematic. Surely, if that is anywhere, it is here and it is now. Well, no, not necessarily so. As C.S. Lewis shrewdly observed, the world does not consist of 100% Christians and 100% non-Christians. There are people, a great many of them, who are slowly ceasing to be Christians, but still call themselves by that name. Some of them are clergymen. There are other people who are slowly becoming Christians, though they do not yet call themselves so. So, belief and unbelief, faith and doubt, these are not always dichotomies or polarities. Sometimes they are points on a continuum. There may be people here today who are slowly ceasing to be Christians but still call themselves by that name. Perhaps there are visitors who are slowly becoming Christians. Moreover, even when we are firm in our faith, it is still worth thinking about why we believe. For it is when we are most confident that the devil may outflank us and catch us with a piece of intellectual sophistication or sophistry. And you know, even for committed Christians, there are times, even if only in the depths of our minds, in the dark hours before dawn after a sleepless night, when moments of doubt arise about whether what we've always been taught is the truth. So talking about belief and unbelief is far from unnecessary even to an audience of Adventists on a Sabbath morning. Now, in the seminar this afternoon, I'll be speaking here at 3.30, I will be suggesting that in combating doubt, our critical faculties are a vital weapon. We must use the God-given powers of reason which distinguish us from the rest of creation. Yet, if we battle disbelief using only our own strength, our struggle will be in vain. The good news is that our Redeemer and Savior not only forgives our sins and restores lives, He can also enable us to believe in Him. In this, as in all else in the Christian life, the grace of God is sufficient. Acknowledging uncertainty can be the first step towards being empowered by faith. The story of the events immediately after Jesus was transfigured, which was the subject of our scripture reading, is told in three of the Gospels. It is found in Matthew 17, Mark 9, and Luke 9. Each of these accounts records the fact that the nine disciples who had remained at the foot of the Mount of Transfiguration could do nothing to help a boy who either was possessed by an evil spirit or suffered from epilepsy the symptoms of which were assumed by contemporaries to be a sign of demon possession. Seventh-day Adventist scholars, indeed many biblical scholars, have debated whether the boy's problem was a disease or a demon. But I don't think actually it's that important a point. The real points are these, that the boy, whether from neurological or demonic causes, suffered terribly, and that the disciples through their own doubts and uncertainties, were completely ineffective in healing and restoring the lad, even though authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and indeed to heal diseases had been conferred on the disciples when Jesus sent the twelve to preach throughout Galilee. The disciples, as Ellen White writes, had gone forth strong in faith and the evil spirits had obeyed their word, but now, Having in the name of Christ commanded the torturing spirit to leave his victim, they were only mocked by a fresh display 
of the power of either spirit or epilepsy. Their faith, the disciples' faith, was not equal to the challenge. But all the gospel narratives also record the, the fact that Jesus, of course, was master of the situation that left his followers flummoxed, and the fact that the boy ultimately was restored to health. Now, all this, as I say, is related by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. However, some important details and some very significant words are only found in Mark's narrative, which also focuses on the twin issues of belief and unbelief. So I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 9, and to keep your Bible open there at Mark 9. We'll be going through this passage. Only Mark records the key fact that as James, John, and Peter approach the rest of the disciples, the rest of those twelves were busy arguing with scribes, that is, with experts in the Mosaic law. In fact, as the context makes plain, the disciples were basically being heckled and mocked by these scribes. Now, earlier in chapter 7, Mark has described how some Pharisees and certain scribes came from Jerusalem, came to Galilee in order to question Jesus' teachings and to find fault with his disciples. These doubters now had, as they saw it, a golden opportunity to expose the followers of this false Galilean prophet in front of their fellow countrymen as a result of their failed attempt to free a boy from the mute spirit controlling him. And Ellen White has wonderfully conjured up this scene in her book, Desire of Ages. She writes, the scribes made the most of this opportunity to humiliate the disciples. Pressing around them, they plied them with questions, seeking to prove that they and their master were deceivers. Here, the rabbis triumphantly declared, was an evil spirit that neither the disciples nor Christ himself could conquer. But suddenly... The accusations ceased. Jesus and the three disciples were seen approaching. The scene is a dramatic one, is it not? Here comes the Messiah and his three most intimate followers. We know from the experience of Moses on Mount Sinai, described in Exodus 34, that celestial glory takes time to pass from human faces. It was not only that Jesus had been transfigured, in addition, Peter, James, and John, like Moses, had been exposed to divine splendor. Some of the light that had blazed forth from heaven to hilltop the night before must still have shone in the faces of the four men as they approached the crowd because Mark tells us in verse 14, all the people were greatly amazed and they ran to Jesus. So suddenly, the subject of attention is not the sick or spirit-possessed child, but the Savior of the world, shining with celestial luminescence. And this gives us an insight. Most of the crowd of people were not there to see affliction eased. Their desire was not for a broken little boy to be restored. They were there for a show. Yet, among that crowd, there would have been some, perhaps even many, who could have been persuaded that Jesus was the Messiah. In them, belief and unbelief were commingled with a desire for spectacle. But their uncertainty about who Jesus was had only been enhanced by the failure of the nine disciples to deal with the lad who seemed to be possessed by a demon. Now, the master and his chosen three followers had arrived with divine light lingering on their countenances. Will the crowd's misgivings and suspicions be confirmed? Or will they be transformed, transfigured, if you will, from the base metal of doubt into the gold of faith? One group present, of course, disbelieved completely. But the rabbis and the experts in the law, like the crowd, were silenced by Jesus' dramatic return. We know this because Jesus is obliged to ask them in verse 16, What are you discussing? 
and it is striking that the scribes do not answer. Now, was this because, having been silenced, even chagrined by Jesus, whenever they'd attempted to discredit him in the past, they preferred not to reply? Or was it that the father of the poor, possessed child simply could not remain silent? Mark does not tell us, but we do know it was not the scribes, rather it is the father who answered Jesus. Rabbi, he begins, according Jesus, a title of respect. And he goes on to describe the boy's symptoms in verses 17 and 18 of Mark chapter 9. Now note that the nature of the lad's afflictions make up a large part of Mark's narratives. And they are described both here in verses 17 and 18 and in verse 20. So they deserve some consideration. In verse 17, the father says his son is under the power of a mute spirit. This may mean that the boy is left unable to speak, but it may mean that the demon does not speak. And this is a contrast with, for example, the demon that Jesus cast out of an adult male and into a herd of pigs, which is described earlier in Mark's gospel in Mark 5. Jesus had conversed with that demon, even been told that its name was Legion. The spirit on which the boy's affliction is blamed does not speak. And this is one reason for believing that the child was really suffering from epilepsy, not demon possession. In verse 18, the father tells Jesus that under the spirit's control, the boy foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and, as some versions of the Bible put it, becomes rigid. But as some of you will know, the King James Version tells us, he pineth away. Now, which of these is it, you may wonder? The original word here in Greek means to dry up or to wither. It's used in James 1.11 to describe the withering of grass under a scorching heat. And it may be that the father here is describing the progressive decline of the boy's physical condition or a stage of seizure in which the boy's body stiffens. And if the latter, it again suggests, along with his foaming at the mouth, the diagnosis of epilepsy. But the point of this passage is not to provide useful diagnostic data. Do we not alt un unmistakably hear, hear a father's distress? My son is dried up, is the cry. His anguish is unmistakable. His child is withering away. You know, England is truly a green and pleasant land. Its gentle rolling hills are verdant all year round. Wendy and I had a different experience when we were at Pacific Union College in the coastal ranges above the Napa Valley in California. Every summer, the hills turn from green to brown. The locals say, oh no, they turn golden. But they're not kidding anyone. The hills turn brown. Because the life is sucked out of the grass by the scorching Californian sun and the want of rain. The grass shrivels and dies. That is what is happening to the boy in this story. He is wasting away the life sucked out of him by the spirit that controls him. If someone does not act soon, it will be too late. In the Napa Valley each year, life springs anew under the refreshing rains of winter and the hills turn green again. The father here is looking for a miraculous regeneration of his son's life. But you know, faith is a delicate organism. It must be nurtured, and what can help it can also harm it. It needs to be exposed to the sunshine of critical thinking or it will be but a poor, stunted thing, easily uprooted. And yet, faith too can be scorched. And if it is only a spirit of skepticism that motivates our inquiries, then it can control us, leaving us wilted and withered. And faith also needs the gentle reign of the Holy Spirit. Faith is a creature of our souls as well as our intellects. The distress of the father of the boy with a mute spirit 
at the withering of his son is the grief of our father in heaven when we cease to converse with him and become mute, when our faith fades and fails. And the solution is to seek divine intervention. In the case of the child, the father sought help. He tells Jesus, I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus' response to the anguished father's concern or complaint in verse 19 seems harsh, even pitiless. Oh, faithless generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? At first sight, it might seem that Jesus' response to the agitated and grief-stricken father is to condemn him for his lack of faith. The lesson might seem to be that if we, feel a degree of doubt, a twinge of uncertainty, we must expect divine condemnation. And it's vital to note Jesus' words carefully because these words of Jesus are not a reply to the Father and a rebuke to Him. No, Jesus denounces the faithlessness of this generation. Jesus is saying that the Israelites as a whole are lacking in faith. Indeed, at the end of the story, in verse 29, Jesus will make it clear that it was the weak faith of the disciples that meant they could not cast out the Spirit. And so possibly this rebuke is directed at them. Alternatively or additionally, it is directed at the crowd of slack-jawed gawkers come for entertainment as much as for enlightenment or edification. Or at the scribe the religious experts who failed to recognize the long-for Messiah standing right in front of them. The Father is not condemned. And we might wonder why. Because the Father clearly is lacking in faith. And Mark's first readers would have understood that. Mark has already described how a hemophiliac woman could be inadvertently healed by Jesus simply by her faith, and how Jesus had brought back to life, raised from the dead, the daughter of Jairus, leader of a synagogue. In Mark 5.34, Jesus told the woman, your faith has made you well. In 5.36, he told Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. The father in Mark 9 certainly does not have the woman's faith. <clears throat> and while we don't know whether Jairus immediately believed, as we, sh- as we shall see in a moment, the father certainly doesn't completely believe that Jesus can cast the spirit out of his son. And you know, at first, his doubts seem justified. The boy is brought over and immediately falls into a convulsion. Before the reader has only heard about the boy's pitiful condition as reported by his parent. Now Mark gives his readers a vivid picture of the boy's sufferings as he thrashes around on the ground and foams at the mouth. Yet, when Jesus turns to the Father, it is not to reprove his lack of faith. Instead, and again, only Mark records this, Jesus basically asks for a case history. This is the only recorded instance in the Gospels where Jesus, having been asked to heal someone, makes specific inquiry about the symptoms, how long they had been experienced, and so on. And it's likely that he calls upon the Father to give a description of the disease and its effects in order that those standing by will fully appreciate the boy's grave condition and therefore take to heart the miracle that Jesus is about to work. But remember that as the father is telling Jesus his child's history, which includes close calls with death through burning and drowning, the boy is writhing on the ground right in front of them. The man must have been beside himself with fear and pity, and he ends by exclaiming, perhaps in part in anger, part in despair, he exclaims to Jesus in verse 22, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help. If you can do anything. Those don't seem words of faith, do they? In fact, they take for granted the possibility that Jesus can't do anything. These are words of doubt, of disbelief. 
And it's only now in verse 23 that Jesus even hints at a reproach to the frantic father. And his words are reminiscent of those he spoke to Jairus. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And it's, it's an interesting expression. Uh, New Testament scholars tell us that the Greek idiom is interesting and actually may suggest that Jesus is quoting the man's words back at him. And some English Bible translations give it this way. They have Jesus replying, if you can, anything is possible if you believe. This actually makes the reproach stronger. For in effect, Jesus is telling the man, you should not say, if I can. That shows you do not believe in me. But any harshness is immediately attenuated by the comforting words, everything is possible for him who believes. Jesus has not condemned the man, he's merely reproved him and prompted him because Jesus has put the ball back into the man's court. The father said, if you can, please do something. Jesus says, I can, but you have to believe. The onus is now on the father to respond. And so now we are at the crisis of Mark's story, because of course by now Mark's readers know that Jesus can heal the boy. He can and will cast out the spirit. So what is at stake is not an epileptic boy's future health. It is the state of his father's soul. How will he respond? Immediately, we are told, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. On the face of it, doesn't this seem an extraordinary statement? How can the man at one and the same time affirm that he does believe and yet beg God's help in overcoming his unbelief? Are the two not mutually exclusive? Well, here we come back to C.S. Lewis's insight. The world does not consist only of 100% believers and 100% unbelievers. But did the man believe at all? Well, yes, in fact, he must have to some extent because the father would not have brought his son if he had not already possessed at least some measure of faith. However, he did not believe entirely. We know this from his plea to Jesus of a moment before, if you can do anything, have compassion on us. Throughout his ministry on earth, Jesus always showed compassion. And this case was to be no exception, but note the father asks, have compassion on us. Not just the Son, have compassion on both of us. And Jesus did feel pity, not only for the terribly afflicted small boy, but also for the doubt-ridden father, in whom both unbelief and belief had collided. When Jesus acted, it was to restore not only one, but both. Jesus doesn't tell the man, sorry, it's not good enough. Belief presupposes the absence of disbelief. Come back when you're a bit stronger. No, Jesus heals. The crowd comes running over to see the poor boy writhing and the tearful father, but Jesus commands the demon or the disease to leave the boy and never return. The boy gives a shriek and lies still. The crowd begins to whisper, he's dead. But Jesus, we are told, takes him by the hand and lifts him to his feet and he stands. No longer writhing, he can stand erect. He is no longer withered and shriveled. He is renewed, flourishing. Later, at the end of the day, after the crowd, the scribes, and the restored father and son had all gone, the nine disciples privately came to Jesus, as Mark 9, verses 28 and 29 describes, and they asked him the obvious question, why couldn't we drive it out? He replies, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. That's all Mark tells us. But the report in Matthew 17, 20 amplifies this reply. While some miracles require prayer and fasting, Jesus tells them, he adds the crucial fact that they failed because they lacked faith. Indeed, he tells them, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, nothing will be impossible for you. 
The reason why the disciples could not free the boy from the spirit or illness controlling him was not, I suggest, that the disciples, having previously, as Luke records, seen even the demons submit to them in his name, now suddenly just encountered a much tougher demon, which was too much for them, and so their faith faltered. I suggest that instead, they were proud of their achievements, and their own spiritual growth had become stunted. This is why Jesus tells them in prayer and fasting, prayer is the key, because then the disciples would be in dialogue with God. Then they would be spiritually powerful. When they focused on themselves, Debating who would be greatest in the new order, they presumed, they were presuming Jesus would establish, forgetting that a relationship with Jesus and the Father was the source of their power to heal de disease and exercise demons, then that power was gone. Their failing was not a momentary lapse of faith, rather it was spiritual pride. They took for granted their ability to perform miracles, and pride went before a fall. So for the Christian, faith and belief are never abstract qualities. Like muscles, they require use or they shrivel. They exist only in the context of a relationship with God. For our faith will lead us to want that relationship. When we reach out to God, He will reach back. And our aspiration to believe can become reality as we feel his touch on our lives. You know, I think we all suffer from doubt at some point. I think probably each of us here has experienced some moment when belief and unbelief collided in our own lives. And yet... When we as Christians feel doubt, we frequently try to deny it. We may be afraid of what others will think of us, or even more potently, we can be afraid of what God will think of us. We feel that we have let God down. The frequent comments of Jesus about faith and lack of faith, which are reported in the Gospels, can be misunderstood. His rebuke to the disciples after failing to cast out the mute spirit could be understood as meaning when it comes to belief and unbelief, God is like some celestial accountant or banker, always on the lookout to check whether we have demonstrated sufficient faith and quick to declare we have an insufficient balance on our belief account. If that's the case and our faith is mixed with some uncertainty, are we not inviting divine anger? No wonder we don't want to admit doubt. Mark's gospel is telling us something very different. God is not eagerly waiting to catch us out in a moment of doubt and condemn us. Instead, he is eager to help us through those moments and to strengthen our belief. The disciples had believed in the past, but then took God for granted, and so they could suddenly be assailed by doubt at a key moment. And... They didn't acknowledge their doubt and ask for help. If Andrew, say, or Simon the Zealot or Thaddeus had cried out to Jesus, Master, I believe I can do this in your name. Please help my unbelief. I don't doubt that disciple would then have found himself able to heal the boy. But the nine disciples don't seem to have been thinking about the suffering child only of their own failure and lack of face. Note that they didn't speak to Jesus about it until they were in private. They had been humiliated. And yet they still could not bring themselves publicly to acknowledge their failure and ask for help. That would no doubt have been even more mortifying. When they finally, though still indirectly, admitted their moment of doubt with that doleful question, why couldn't we drive it out? It was then that they at last were allowing Jesus to help them. He pointed them towards reliance on God, not on self, and to a relationship with God. To reliance on God and a relationship with God. And it was this, not some magical formula based on a notional quotient of faith that would renew their access to divine power. Admitting their unbelief 
was the first step to allowing God to enable belief. And the same was true of the Father. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, was the cue not for a scolding, but for a miracle. The man had the faith of neither the hemophiliac woman nor the centurion who believed immediately in who Jesus held up as a reproach to Israel, but the father neither claimed more than he possessed, nor yet, in contrast to the scribes, had he decidedly avowed disbelief in Jesus. He honestly acknowledged that he had doubts, that belief and unbelief were both present and in a state of tension, but he wanted to overcome his doubts. His desire to believe was belief. Although his faith was no greater than a mustard seed, it was there. And Jesus honored the grain of faith as though it had been the size of a mountain. Perhaps you or your friends, your children, are not certain whether everything the Bible teaches is true. Perhaps you find Jesus in his message very attractive, but feel some of the claims made by him or for him are a little difficult to believe. Or perhaps your lifelong faith has been shaken by disaster to your parents, to your children, even to yourself. You want to believe, but right now you can't, not totally and implicitly. And the problem is we so often hear sermons about faith that moves mountains and stories about the valiant witness of heroic believers that it's easy to assume that faith only counts when it is absolute and unquestioning. And when we feel a want of faith, that can create even more doubts in our own mind as to whether we truly are in communion with Christ. Doubt can then feed on doubt setting up a vicious downward cycle of uncertainty that can end in outright disbelief. But friends, the good news is faith does not always burn with a steady, roaring flame. Sometimes it sputters and flickers and is so weak that it sends out neither heat nor flame but only smoke. But our loving Lord Jesus will not dismiss this small spark of faith. He will nourish it. The good news of Mark 9 is that if you want to believe, you do believe. And then God will help your unbelief. So if you are not sure about whether Christianity is all true, or if you find your faith shaken by moments of uncertainty, cling to the fact that you want to believe. Admit you have doubts. Admit it to yourself and to Jesus. Allow him to nurture and nourish the flickering spark of your flame as he fed the 5,000 and as he feeds us still with his body and blood. The story of the disciples who doubted, the son with a mute spirit and the father who wanted to believe tells us when we admit our shortcomings, whether our stunted spiritual growth or our doubts and withered faith, we have taken the first step to allowing Jesus to remake us and renew us. We have a Savior who knows, understands, and can transform. Not only our moral and our spiritual flaws and our physiological and neurological weaknesses, but also our mental reservations and uncertainties. He lived for us, he died for us, and he will heal and restore us in every sense.